So good afternoon to everyone. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, next symposium that is an, an EIGG ER European Region Symposium. It's an official symposium in which we present the three chairmen of the three section of the uh, uh, International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics. I present myself, I'm Mario Barbagallo, I'm the president of the European uh, region of EIGG. And now we have three fantastic speakers that are the three uh, uh, chairmen. The first one will be Professor Suresh Rattan uh, from Denmark. He is the chair of the biological section of EIGG ER that will take a lecture on taking, stat of taking status of biogerontology in Europe. Uh, the second speaker will be Professor Timo Sandberg from Finland, he is the chair of the clinical section of EIGG ER that will give a lecture on repurposing older cardiovascular drugs for COVID-19 treatment. And then we have Professor Sandra Torres, he is the chair of the social behavioral section of EIGG ER that will give a lecture on network and resources for social behavioral research on aging and old age, European investment that extend beyond this continent. Uh, as I said before, the first speaker will be Professor Suresh Rattan that uh, will give the lecture on taking status of your journal in Europe. Suresh. Hello, I'm Suresh Rattan. I'm the chairman of the European region of IAGG's uh, biological section, and I will be talking about the status of biogerontology in Europe. In Europe, the biological sciences research is, has been going on for almost 40 years in a great, great manner, and it's continuing. Basically, we deal with the four major aspects of aging, evolutionary and demographic aspects, descriptive aspects, mechanistic aspects, and more recently, interventional aspects. So in the evolutionary and demographic aspects, there are many countries involved. And in Denmark, where I am presently based, our Aarhus University and another university, Southern Denmark University, is very well known for that. Recently, actually, we lost a very famous biodemographer from Denmark, Professor Jim Wopel, who recently died. But he has been contributing a lot in the understanding of the evolutionary and demographic aspects of aging. The things which we, the Europe has been famous for uh, studying these aspects has been the trends in changing average lifespans, changing life expectancies, and maximum lifespan records. And there have been two schools, those who think that these maximum lifespans will continue to increase or life expectancies will continue to reach, or the other school which thinks at one stage we will reach a plateau. But Europe has been in the forefront of this kind of research for almost five decades. That has also answered a very important question that when does biological aging begin in our lifetime? Does aging begin from birth or from some other stage in life? And that's where the concept of essential lifespan was uh, developed in Europe, basically from our labs, that essential lifespan is the lifespan needed by the species in natural environment to continue generations for the reproduction and continuation of generation. That's essential lifespan. So if an organism lives beyond the essential lifespan of an organism, of the species, then aging will start. For Homo sapiens, this essential lifespan then comes out to be around 45 years. Considering this as the definition of aging, then the aging has been described in descriptive terms, what happens during aging at the level of species, at the levels of population, individuals, systems, organs, cells, organelles, moleculars. And this has been a major theme throughout 
the countries in Europe, and which includes Austria, Denmark, France, as you can see, almost all the countries have been contributing, and there have been many, many uh, famous uh, people coming out of that and great contributions made in the description of aging. And what we have learned from those descriptions is that, yes, what happens in individuals, so this from top to bottom description, from individual to systems, to basic molecular level, to metabolomic level. And this is not a small achievement. The aging has been described tremendously well. And what have we learned from all this description where Europe has contributed uh, a lot? And that is the mechanistic aspects, how aging happens, why aging happens, are there genes involved in aging, what kind of proteins are involved? And that's again, once again, almost all the countries within Europe have been great contributors to this research. And the common message coming is that there are no Geronto genes. There are no genes which have evolved specifically with the purpose of causing aging. Aging still happens, not because there are genes, but because evolution does not make perfect systems. There are imperfect systems of survival, repair, and maintenance. So, Occurrence and accumulation of damage at all levels is a central theme in the mechanisms of aging. There can be variations, the tissue dependent variations, species dependent variations. But because, as I mentioned, the systems of maintenance and repair are not perfect in evolution, they never are. So they allow the occurrence and accumulation of the damage, which has its major influence manifested during the period of aging, which happens if we live beyond the essential lifespan of our species. So there is a huge amount of data available, what kind of damages are happening at what level. Now, this raises the basic question of how do we then intervene in these processes? Do we go from this reductionistic correlation back in the same way that we are trying to find stimulators, inhibitors, stabilizers, and removers by taking one target at a time? that okay, if mTOR is the problem, let's do something about it or glycation. But the problem with biological systems, which we have realized is it doesn't work like that. It's easy to come from top to bottom, but going from bottom upward, where manipulating one thing like telomere or methylation can show effects at the functional and behavioral and every other aspect of aging. That is the biggest challenge. But this is where most of the research is going on. And we have aging treatment, preventions and management. Either these are piecemeal remedies that try to correct what is going wrong, that's like organs and stem cells, and most recently the senolytic approaches that get rid of the uh, senescent cells, or cell rejuvenation, which is the latest approach, which is also being followed in uh, uh, Europe, or replenishment. You give hormones, bioextracts, food supplements, cosmetics, all these kind of research is going on in many, many labs in within Europe. And the latest approach is the more holistic approach, hormesis, this which we sometimes also call biphasic dose response or U-shaped response, where, where uh, something which is more toxic at a higher dose is generally health beneficial at a lower dose. And we call this phenomenon as a hormesis that exposure to low level and repeated stress of choice, in the case of human beings, that becomes a very important word, stress of choice is going to be health beneficial. And the paradigm of hormesis is physical exercise. Exercise is beneficial because it causes challenge, it causes damage, it produces free radicals, it produces acids, it kills the cells, and then you get benefit. This is the powerful phenomenon of hormesis, which is more a holistic kind of intervention in aging for the both the quantitative aspects of age and the qualitative aspects of age. Things which cause hormesis have been termed hormatins, and this is also basically a European contribution uh, to the literature in terminology. Physical hormatins, like I said, exercise, hot temperature, cold temperature, radiation, or mental hormatins, doing brain exercises, or most commonly these nutritional hormatins. A lot of things we eat in the food, like spices and herbs, they are useful because they are actually toxic. 
they are toxic at higher doses but at low doses they work as hormetins they induce the damage and the cells and the body tries to counteract the damage and you get benefit similarly calorie restriction and intermittent fasting that is a very popular research area being used throughout the world and especially in europe and we have lots and lots of information around it so in conclusion i would just like to give this central message that biological aging research, which is biogerontology, which is also the name of a Springer Nature uh, journal, uh, biogerontology being run from Denmark, me being its editor in chief. In European countries, this biogerontology is a highly active, innovative, and successful research within the umbrella of. IAGG and this European regional section. We also have a book series, Healthy Aging and Longevity, again, uh, published by Springer Nature, uh, where we bring in the latest biogerontological research going on within Europe and beyond Europe. And we have published the Encyclopedia of Biomedical Gerontology. So I am very happy to share this aspect that the biological section of the IAGG's European region is most lively, active, and continues to be highly productive, innovative, and successful. Thank you. The next speaker is Professor Timo Sandberg from Finland. is the chair of the clinical section of IAGG ER, and we present his lecture on repurposing older cardiovascular drugs for COVID-19 treatment. Timo. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My uh, topic this afternoon is repurposing older cardiovascular drugs for COVID-19 treatment. These are my disclosures. <clears throat> I use many drugs myself, of those I'm presenting. So for the introduction, uh, Vaccinations against uh, corona infection are progressing globally in different phases in different countries, but still also drugs are needed for treatment of infection. However, uh, specific antivirals have their limitations. There are some available, but anyway, they are, they are not uh, perfect. Besides infection, also the state of the host is important for the outcome in COVID-19. Because patients with cardiovascular diseases are at special risk group and endothelial dysfunction is important for COVID-19 complications, existing cardiovascular drugs may be useful, even without specific action on the virus. And I'm now in my presentation referring to a recent article made by a European group, European uh, Geriatric Medicine Society interest group, uh, published last um, uh, autumn about this topic. Okay, uh, COVID-19 corona infection is also a microvascular disease, and, and that's very important uh, reason for complications during corona infection. You can see here the endothelial cell and, and coronavirus and uh, endothelial cell, of course, they are very, very important in uh, blood vessel function. And uh, you can see on the, on the left side, normal endothelial and its functions, and on the right side, the various effects corona infection can have on various uh, endothelial functions and also in many organs from brain heart lungs and and so on kidneys and so on and also uh, besides uh, this endothelitis a cytokine storm can be a very important pathogenetic factor and uh, also thrombosis of course leads to various complications and, and they are frequently seen in severe corona infection patients. And then we have these existing cardiovascular drugs and they have many actions uh, for these different uh, pathogenetic uh, factors from statins, from ACE inhibitors, anticoagulants, antiplatelet agents like aspirin, 
they have effects on the endothelium. Here is the list of potential drugs I'm uh, presenting in this uh, in my in my lecture. Uh, first, I'll talk about uh, drugs affecting the renin onion tensin aldosterone system, like ACE inhibitors and uh, and ATR blockers, then statins, aspirin, anticoagulants, and finally some words about colchicine. So first. <clears throat> ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, you may remember that uh, initially in, in, two, in 2020, there were concerns uh, of the uh, effects of these drugs because it was known that coronavirus uses ACE2 as its receptor to enter the cell, and, and these drugs have effects, and effects on these receptors. Okay, this concerns were unfounded. This has been uh, uh, shown several times during the two years, two and a half years. These drugs are safe. And on the contrary, these drugs may even be uh, protective. And there are some studies that especially uh, in combination with statins, there might be protection. Then statins, they are very important. Cardiovascular drugs, of course, used by millions of people, and they are established drugs to improve prognosis in patients with cardiovascular disease. This is, this is uh, evidence-based several times. But also, several observational studies to date have reported better prognosis also in patients with uh, COVID-19 uh, if they are using statins. And uh, actually, there have been quite recent uh, meta-analysis of this topic. Uh, this is one of them, of, of 25 observational studies, and it was uh, uh, this um, uh, analysis was uh, published last uh, autumn. Uh, over 1,440,000 uh, uh, patients with COVID-19, and among them, statins or statin use was independently associated with a significant reduction in mortality. And moreover, subgroup analysis showed that only chronic use of statins significantly reduced mortality according to the adjusted models. But uh, of course, many investigators say that uh, we need randomized trials to, to finally prove this and uh, some of them are ongoing. But any day, anyway, I think there are no other uh, drug where we have this kind of observational study evidence uh, in COVID-19. Then, of, of course, aspirin and antiplatelets, they are established drugs in secondary prevention of cardiac disease. But thus far, there's no solid evidence that uh, aspirin and drugs like that would improve prognosis in COVID-19, but of course the data are not very, very, very big. Then anticoagulants, they are established drugs for prevention for thromboembolic complications, and these complications of course are frequent in COVID-19. Um, and uh, studies so far uh, uh, suggest that anticoagulants in therapeutic doses uh, may seem beneficial in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Um, well, switching existing oral, anti, uh, oral anticoagulants to parenteral heparin, that's, that's an open question. Um, but anyway, as a conclusion, optimal antithrombotic therapy in COVID-19 is yet to be determined and, and the data is insufficient for general recommendations. And finally, of these drug classes, colchicine, heard a few words about that. It's of course an ancient anti-inflammatory anti drug, especially used in code. Um, during the uh, last few years, there have been very intriguing results in, in two big trials, which showed benefit in secondary prevention of coronary artery disease in patients uh, already treated with statins. 
And of course, uh, that uh, raised interest whether this drug also could have benefit in COVID-19. And there was this uh, randomized large called corona trial, which uh, showed evidence of benefit in COVID-19 patients and as two deaths and, and hospital admissions. But anyway, um, totality of evidence, I think, is still insufficient for recommendations in the treatment of, of COVID-19 with colchicine. So, dear uh, colleagues, uh, conclusions. Most cardio current cardiovascular drugs can be safely continued during COVID-19. I think this is a very safe conclusion and, and a secure conclusion. But in addition to that, some drug classes, drug class, classes especially uh, statins, may even be protective uh, during COVID-19. But of course, we need more studies about this topic. So thank you very much. And uh, my warm greetings from Finnish summer and midnight sun. Thank you. Thanks. The next speaker is Professor Sandra Torres from Sweden. This is the chair of the social behavioral section of IAGG ER. That will give the lecture on networks and resources for social behavioral research on aging and old age, European investment that extend beyond this continent. Sandra. Good afternoon, good evening. I have been recording a couple of these sessions and I've started the same way because we have no idea when you will be joining us to look at these recordings. It is a pleasure to address you today. I am doing so this time as president of the social behavioral section of IAGG ER. If you're new to the IAGG um, circle, that means the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics European region. Today, I'm going to be addressing you on networks and resources for social behavioral research in aging and old age. Our symposium combines the different sections for IAGG ER, and I thought it would be useful not only for Europeans attending the meeting, but also from people outside of our continent to get a sense of the European investments that they can actually reach through what is known as cost actions. So that's why you see at the very bottom of my screen here, the cost logo. Now, the rationale for today's presentation is the following. I'm a sociologist, so let me put that out there from the beginning, which means that I'm very well aware that the conditions under which we conduct research on aging and old age around the globe are very different. And those conditions create inequalities as far as research infrastructure are concerned, but also as far as our respective abilities to conduct and disseminate research. In some parts of the world, the funding of the, for the research we conduct comes primarily from local, regional, or national funders, if we're lucky enough to secure a grant. In other parts of the world, we're fortunate enough to have those levels of funding, as well as levels of funding of research infrastructure that stretch across the continent. In the case of Europe, for example, EU has funding available to us working in European countries, as long as we conduct research that is comparative in nature. Now, the other reason why I'm addressing you on this is that as chair of IGG ER's social behavioral section, I feel that it's my moral obligation to offer colleagues in Europe, as well as beyond, insights into the kind of networks and resources that are available for those of us doing this type of research. Because some of this um, funding actually transcends geographical distance, but not a lot of people seem to know that they're out there and that it can access those resources. So the presentation has been designed to hopefully give you an idea of what the cost action networks are about and how they could potentially help you build your own career and also expand your networks. So what is cost then? Cost is abbreviation for European Cooperation in Science and Technology. I'm not paid by cost people, <laughs> but I happen to have enjoyed quite a sizable number of networks opportunities through the funding that they offer. This is a funding program that encourages networking of scientific and technological research activities throughout Europe and beyond. Now, COST follows three strategic priorities. COST tries to promote and spread excellence in research and innovation. They're trying to foster interdisciplinary research specifically with the idea that it could lead to breakthrough science. 
and it is trying to empower and retain young research and innovators. So it is people in the beginning of their career, which COS considers to be doctoral students and up to seven years after they defended the dissertation to be the emerging scholars that they spend so much time, effort and resources on. COS is mainly funded through European framework programs, such as Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe, to give you an example. So COS invests in something called COS actions, which is a fancy word of saying network pretty much. And these COS actions aim to strengthen Europeans' capacity to address scientific, technological, as well as societal challenges. A COS action is an interdisciplinary research network that brings both researchers and innovators together to investigate a topic of their choice for four years. So basically there are networks made up of researchers from academia, from SMEs, from public institutions and other relevant organizations or interested parties. So in the, aim, in the area of aging and old age, for example, we tend to work with stakeholders. So it could be local, regional or national actors in, for example, just to give you an example, elder care as a sector. So these networks or cost actions offer a pan-European environment for individuals of all levels of seniority to grow their professional research networks and to boost their careers. That's the main aim of COST. These networks are open to all COST members. There's 40 of them at present, all of them based in Europe. They have, however, a cooperating member in Israel, as well as a partner in South Africa. And they also have bilateral opportunities offered to non-cost countries through what they call the cost global networking. So for example, in North America, EU access is a portal for global networking into cost actions. And in Latin America is EU access. Don't know if you've heard about them, but they may be worth a doodle or Google mixing up those two. Anyway, cost programs do not fund research as such. What they provide is funding for networking activities of various kinds, but it is in the purpose of conducting research or setting up for research. Now, participants in a cost action collaborate through a range of called networking tools, such as meetings. There's funding for people to meet one another through cost actions, and they are grouped into working groups. That's the name they use in cost language. Conferences are also offered including stakeholders, so not only the members of these cost actions, there's short-term missions that are also funded through costs. And what that means is that you can apply through a cost action and their funding in order to go somewhere for, say, anything from a couple of weeks to a couple of months in order to complete a small concrete project. It could be anything like co-authoring a paper, together with somebody in another part of the world, or it could be uh, harmonizing a data set, or maybe even engaging in analysis for data sets that were not collected necessarily for the purpose of being compared, but that you're trying to explore the idea of comparing them because you happen to understood that somebody else somewhere else in another country happens to have been done research that resembles what you've done before. There's training schools peer offer by all cost actions. Every cost action must plan at least one training course, a training school a year. These are open to doctoral students and emerging scholars. So they're building capacity through these networks. Virtual networking grants are also available through COST. And then there's the publications that COST actions put together. It could be policy briefs and it could be synthesis papers, not just peer review papers, not just book chapters and books. The policy briefs and synthesis papers are always available free of charge through these actions own websites. Now, the actions last for four years and each receive funding of around 130,000 euros per year for these activities. And usually, typically, an action includes around 28 full or corporated members of the cost action. And what I mean by that, those are the members of the action. These are the people that are, in fact, working towards reaching the goals of the action. But the training schools, the conferences are available to all. You just need to alert and follow their cycles. So 
How do you become involved? Potentially could be your next question or what else do you need to know? One thing that I would like you to keep in mind is that these actions act as a pre-portal to other funding or instruments in Europe. So the follow-up proposals from COS Action have a 37% success rate, which leads to about 5.8 million euros spin-off funding per action. What that means, my friends, is that although these are not EU-funded projects for research, these gives you an idea of what it is people around Europe are investing on in terms of topics. Now, because of the openness of cost, these actions, which run for four years, you can join them and participate in the events at any given time. So you need not necessarily be a full member, you need not have joined from the very beginning in order to take part in the activities. Now, depending on the country you are based and the bilateral cooperation, you may have different kinds of rights and access to these different actions, activities. But they are there and they are available and offer far more than some of us seem to be aware of. So if you're looking for a research partner in Europe and or if you happen to be an emerging scholar in the beginning of your career, according to cost standards, and want to take part in the training schools where free of charge, you want to keep an eye on cost actions. They bring together a large number of European researchers in our field over four, cy four year cycles, as I said, and often these researchers during those four years collaborate to put together proposals that then apply for research funding. So for example, I was involved in one of those actions a couple of years ago, it ended in 2021, and that action ended up leading to another project now with five countries. So if you look into what cost actions are being funded at any time, you get a very good sense of where they are, network hungry people in Europe, because they have specific goals in mind for these actions. Now, from 2018, already completed, however, are these three actions that happen to do with aging and old age specifically and socio-behavioral sciences. I'm not listing all of the cost actions that have to do with the clinical sciences or health sciences, um, biology or anything else like my colleagues in IAG, IAG, IAGG are presenting today. But these three have recently finished and have produced an array of resources, such as things as these papers, policy briefs, as well as a network where you can access people that are invested in these topics. It's ageism, family solidarity, and old age exclusion were the three from um, over the past years that have just been completed. Now, these are the ones that just received funding. There's four of them in aging and old age that have implications for socio uh, behavioral sciences. It's Smart Habitat for the Elderly the Network for Research in Vascular Aging that has a socio-behavioral component, International Interdisciplinary Network on Smart Healthy Age-Friendly Environments, and the Network on Evidence-Based Physical Activity in Old Age. Besides these, there's also other cost actions at once, and some of them have been funded now, that have implications for aging. They may have a working group on aging, even though they're not necessarily focused solely on aging. There's around 60 cost actions ending every year through this kinds of funding. So there's quite a lot out there when it comes to research networks in this part of the world. And as I said, through various activities accessible to all. So if you want to become involved, like I said, I don't work for cost. I just know that they do wonderful things, especially for emerging scholars. Then you can submit an application, of course, yourself, if you happen to be one of the 40 members. This requires a joint effort of at least seven different cost members or cooperating states, at least seven members, but remember the average cost action includes around 28. So it's really, really large networks. Usually about half of them need to be what they call inclusiveness targets or ITC countries. These change different years depending on the EU's own political ambitions. The next deadline for cost action applications is in October 20, 2022. You can check out the list for ongoing cost actions in the cost website, and I'm giving it here today, www.cost.eu. There's a database of all cost actions that offer you a short description of them, a list of the members in the management team, and a memorandum of understanding, which 
basically means a proposal for the action. So you get a good sense of what are the goals for each action, which kind of working groups are working within the realm of an action, and so on and so forth. All the activities are posted um, through the specific action um, websites, not through the cost website. So the cost website just gives you an orientation, what's out there, and then you click on each specific actions on website. Now, once you have identified a cost action that you would like to join, and as I mentioned, you can join for different as either a member or a participant of different activities, you can do one of the following alternatives. You can send an expression of interest via the cost website for the actual action you would like to join, which means that the cost people know that you have expressed interest. And you can also contact working group members. You can also contact the chair, but that will be a very BCB for the four years that the action is working. So I would rather you contact a working group member and also a working group leader. You could also contact the country partners if you happen to be in one of the 40 countries of the cost or the collaborating partner that is Israel or the partner member, which is Israel, uh, South Africa, sorry. In these countries, there's something called a cost national coordinator. And these people can tell you, it's usually a national funder with that specific responsibility, which cost actions do they have for representation from your own country in a cost action at any given time? And do they need representation? Sometimes a cost action starts, and although there's spaces reserved, a certain number of them per country, they don't get filled up. So do give your cost national coordinator a call if you happen to be in a country where you have such a coordinator. And if not, just check the website, see what these actions are about, see if there's anything out there that you can join, potentially one of the conferences if you cannot join as a member or one of the training schools. This is all I had for today, my friends. Thank you for your attention. Hope the presentation was useful. If you have any kind of concern or want to pick my brains about cost actions, as I mentioned, I was heavily involved in Rosenet. You can give me a call. And if not, join us for the Q&A session after this particular symposium. Thank you for today. You please start. Good afternoon to everyone. So I, I, I have just to thank all the three speakers with three fantastic speakers, the three uh, chairman of the free section of the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatric European Region, Professor Suresh Rattan. Yeah, Professor Suresh okay, Rattan is the president of hmm. the uh, biological section. Professor, Professor Timo Stander is president of the uh, clinical section and and Professor Sandra Torres is a president of the social behavioral section. We have three fantastic lectures. Uh, I just want to remind that uh, our next Congress of the European uh, uh, region will be in Malaga in, on 26, 28 of June of 2028. I want to invite everyone to participate at this next European Congress. I don't think there is any any uh, question from the auditorium. That is, Professor Suresh Ratan is asking to. Yeah. yeah, no, I just wanted to bring in some discussion parts, especially uh, with the sociology section, because we all know aging is very complex. And it's not biology does not explain everything. And sociology doesn't explain everything. But Sandra, can you see some ways of we three sections um, collaborating more actively, European level or global level, where we can learn from each other and teach each other? Do you think there is anything good about it? Not just uh, saying, yes, all collaborations are good, but what is the good and bad if we try to combine biology with sociology yeah, and sociology so, with the clinical? So the person the presentation that I ma made was about the resources offered by the EU to something called cost actions. Mm -hmm. Cost actions are networks that bring together people who are working on an area 
they need not necessarily be about aging, but there's a sizable number of cost actions about aging. Hmm. At the moment, there's four that are just running. One is actually on vascular disease. Hmm. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, which I presented in my presentation that just finished. So in those cost actions, usually there are scholars from all spheres, all disciplines that come together to actually work on a common goal. But these are not research projects. They are mm. research networks. And what that means is that they're synthesizing knowledge in order to identify not only knowledge gaps, but also the way forward. So to give you an example, I was involved in a cost action on reducing old age exclusion. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did in there was, among other things, to team up with people working in geronto biogerontology in your field mm -hmm. to create a model of how to think about social exclusion that went beyond what we were focusing on, which is as social scientists, the spheres of social exclusion, social exclusion from amenities, social inclusion for transportation, social exclusion when it comes to services, social inclusion in neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. So one of the researchers there, for example, brought into the cost action biogerontologists at one point in time. So as I see it, one of the greatest ways through which you can establish more collaboration across disciplines in the field of aging is through cost actions, because mm -hmm. cost actions are not determined to be disciplinary. They're actually encouraging multidisciplinary aspects. But that means also that we need to team up with one another from the very beginning in order mm -hmm. to write those applications so that they do, in fact, are cross-disciplinary from the very beginning. Now, if you look at the cost actions that are being funded at the moment, and I will mm -hmm. just read and look at my slides as I mm -hmm. am um, speaking to you right now, there are a couple of them running at this very moment that just started mm -hmm. a couple of mm -hmm. years ago, uh, a couple of, uh, this past year. So you have one called Smart Habitat for the Elderly. You have mm -hmm. one called the Network for Research in Vascular Aging. You have one called the International Interdisciplinary Network on Smart, Healthy, Age-Friendly Environments. And you have a network on evidence-based physical activity in old age. Mm -hmm. The actual websites for each of those actions are in the presentation I just made. And if you go into those websites, they're fairly new, so they're recently established. But you can see in the short description mm -hmm. of them that they are, in fact, multidisciplinary from the very beginning. So they were designed as a multidisciplinary effort. Because the problem sometimes is that at least in some parts of the uh, European continent, it is encouraged that you work mostly disciplinary or mm -hmm. with adjacent disciplines. So the calls are not multidisciplinary enough sometimes. And that creates a problem either because they're not a call in that matter or because the people evaluating the call do not have the breadth of interdisciplinary knowledge that would be necessary to actually evaluate the call in a fair enough mm -hmm. fashion. So I think the infrastructure that we have in place for funding, it's one of the problems that we face when trying to reach out about disciplines. And that's why I decided to make the presentation I made within the context of this conference about mm -hmm. cost actions, because they're the best mm -hmm. platform in Europe right now, funding interdisciplinary collaborations for four years at a time with training schools and an array of other tools. And it is fostering an emerging capacities in aging that from the very beginning are being trained to work interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. I hope I answer your questions, Suresh. Yeah. Yeah, and I hope there. I managed to get people to start thinking about cost yeah. actions as a way of establishing which kinds of networks can potentially help you wherever you are in the world, but also what is preoccupying the imagination of aging scholars in our continent and beyond. Mm -hmm. Well, Thanks thank very you. much, Sandra. So I, uh, since there are questions from the, audit, from, from the auditorium, I just want to ask something to uh, uh, Professor Rattan and also mm -hmm. to Professor Sandberg. Uh, um, uh, Suresh, uh, yeah. you, you actually mentioned that at the moment, they are not identified as gerontogenes. Yes. However, uh, we know that uh, the, the goal is to have uh, to prolong life as much as we can. Of mm -hmm. course, or misses, it's it's a, 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 a wonderful tool that uh, uh, um, can allow us to um, uh, 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 prolong life in in some way. 
But uh, uh, first, the first question is: uh, Do you be, do you think that there are no Geronto genes, or they are just not uh, been identified yet, and maybe they will be in the future? And mm -hmm. how long can we prolong life? Mm -hmm. And the second question to, I will ask to Timo: uh, uh, What to clinically can do to prolong life and then and have a, a healthy, a long life? Yeah. Very important issues you have raised, Mario. Nothing in biology works without genes. So when we say there are no Geronto genes, that basically means there are no genes evolved with a purpose to cause aging and death. Genes are there for survival, for re maintenance, for repair, but they are not perfect. So but if we are looking for a gene which causes aging, no gene causes aging. Do you think there are genes to cause cancer? There are no cancer causing genes. Cancer happens when normal genes go crazy. They have a mutation, they lose function or they gain a new function. Yeah, it's the same thing. Evolution has not evolved oncogenes, but oncogenes are there virtually because normal genes do not behave properly for whatever reasons due to accumulation of damage. Same story is about aging. There are no genes for aging. There are genes for life. And we need to find which genes give more problem at what stage and can we improve upon them and what will be the trade of things. So we can definitely play around with the genes if we know how to make a better gene than a normal gene. So maybe Timo wants to take the second part of the story. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very good. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Suresh. And, and uh, thank you, Mario and uh, all. I think there are two things in, in, in longevity and, and uh, sort of increasing uh, lifespan. First, uh, are we talking about uh, increasing the species-specific uh, uh, lifespan, which yeah. for, for humans is, is uh, the, the record is 122 so far? And uh, I think that's a tough question, and uh, to increase that from, from beyond that, and uh, I think it's, it's it, it has something to do with the carrot science and, and finding the ways to to sort of um, sort of the um, uh, instruments to to go to the aging process as such. But I think more important for clinicians is to sort of maximize the lifespan of humans. Up to the, to the optimal range, and and uh, I think that's that's possible. And uh, we are talking about the compression of morbidity and and uh, how to how to live uh, not only the length but also the quality. And uh, I think that that's more important for me. And then I I think uh, I think uh, we have exercise, we have um, lifestyle uh, interventions, we have drugs for for hypercholesterolemia and uh, hypotension not to so that people are not uh, uh, dying prematurely so so I, I think that's the most important uh, to maximize the the, the, the lifespan of, of humans in the in, in that range and I leave that uh, increasing beyond that to 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 sort of uh, aging researchers and uh, it's going to be quite tough and maybe it's it's it, it can be possible of course but uh, it's 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 another issue i think yeah. yeah maybe i can add a little comment on that in addition to timo that yes we need drugs but we need drugs for health how to maintain health, how to recover mm. health, how to enhance health. Yeah. The drugs against diseases, they are also needed when the disease is there. But drugs against aging, that is mm -hmm. a, a totally wrong approach. Drugs for health, usually drugs yeah, are yeah, against yeah, it. That, 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 so um, yeah, yeah, that is yeah. where like exercise is a drug for health. It does not treat a disease. It improves the health mechanisms and some diseases might get either controlled or better managed. So our approach in aging intervention has to be from anti-aging. Get rid of that word. I hate yeah, yeah, the word yeah, yeah. anti-aging. Yeah. Yeah. We need to, like we maintain and improve health. It will also give some dividend on lifespan and health span. So we should not worry about how long we want to live. Theoretically, yes, we should live forever. Why not? But by maintaining but the, health. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, the earth, earth could uh, so the, just, it's not sustainable that uh, everyone would. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, at least we can. 
ideals we have Which to capture sure. ideals yeah. but ideals are never supposed to be yeah, yeah, reached yeah. because otherwise yeah. they are not ideals if they <laughs> yeah. okay I agree. sorry we, mario we must maximize okay. health we must maximize health span and not exactly. life span exactly i fully agree thanks suresh thanks timo thanks sander we had a wonderful section i want uh, again to thanks the free speakers they are the free chairman uh, the free of the free section of uh, yagger i just want to give you appointment to uh, to conclude the section to the next uh, yagger congress in malaga in 26 28 of june in 2024 and there may be some other appointment in 2023 please uh, uh, just check our uh, eagger uh, website to get uh, uh, updated to all, all the news of uh, uh, eagger also there is an, a new uh, news from uh, professor from the social behavioral section from professor sondes and and and, and many Any other news? So thanks again to uh, to everyone okay, and have a nice you. Congress. Okay. Okay. And good night. Bye. <laughs> From Finland. Bye. Right, good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>